so today I'm introducing to you um, uh, an overview about mitigating different types of bias in graph uh, neural networks. I just need to set a timer for myself so that I don't uh, rush into time. Um, so first I will um, give a brief idea about the motivation um, for, the, uh, for the topic and why it's important. And then I will uh, give a, a more formal definition about the problem and the different types of bias. Then I will introduce two solutions and uh, the properties, the architecture, and the results um, related to them, namely SL, DS, GCN, and FAIR GNN. And finally, I will conclude with some results. Um, first of all, um, GNNs can be used in many applications and in particular, many uh, sensitive applications. Um, uh, for, for crime prediction, it's, it's really cool to uh, think about the, the fact that um, the person's relations with other people might be a predictor to um, a predictor to whether he is guilty or not, whether he has done a crime or not. Um, so for, for crime prediction, um, capturing the network information of a person might be an indicator, not a final indicator, but might be an indicator of whether he's guilty or not. The same for job matching. You might think that the existence of someone in a given network might be an indicator that he has um, a certain set of skills. Um, so it's it's quite interesting to be able to use this um, this uh, information to uh, increase the performance of machine learning models and enhance uh, our prediction. However, um, uh, we face the problem of bias that uh, any machine learning model faces. Uh, and when bias exists, the prediction varies based on attributes that are not meant to affect the target variable. Um, and the classical um, examples that everybody gives are age, race, and gender. So you, you accuse someone of being a criminal just because of his color or just because of his uh, gender. Uh, and this should not uh, be the case. Um, but also, um, the, the, the thing that, that is worth mentioning is that Bias is not only about social attributes. There are some technical properties of machine learning models that uh, can introduce bias. So you can think of images um, and how corner and edge pixels um, are having less chance of being represented in the uh, following layers. Um, and that's why we introduce padding in CNS, for instance, because to, to give the corner and edge pixels um, a, a roughly a, an equivalent chance as the center pixels. Um, this can also be uh, um, imagined in the, in the field of language where uh, you have out of vocabulary words and then you use backing off models just to uh, make sure that uh, you don't misclassify based on a word that you didn't hear before. Um, and he, and um, related to, what's related to our topic, GNMs, is um, uh, we have some technical uh, properties, degree, degree of, uh, of a given node in a GNN, that's something I, I think most people know. Um, so the degree of a node uh, is, is a technical property that, that might introduce bias. Also, um, the distance of a given um, unlabeled node to a labeled node in a, in a semi-supervised setting. I will uh, give more formal definitions about these technical properties, but just to uh, put, uh, put in mind that uh, bias is not only about social attributes, but can also be related to um, uh, technical properties of a given architecture. Um, first, uh, I just need to, because this is the first presentation of, of this round of presentations today, I, I, I would like to um, clarify a bit the, the difference between the terminologies of bias, fairness, and explainability, because um, they are often used together uh, and interchangeably um, in a way that does not show the difference. So basically, uh, the, the bias that we just introduced in the previous slides is, is, a pro is a negative property that we are trying to mitigate in order to improve fairness of a given machine learning model. And fairness, of course, is, is, uh, is a positive property, um, uh, which, which states that um, nobody, is, nobody is just, uh, so no classification is taken based on a property that should not be taken into consideration. And explainability of the machine learning model, as will be explained later by my, my colleagues, also for fairness. Um, so uh, explainability is just that we are trying to um, check 
what are the features that are most significant in taking a decision. So, so uh, uh, in summary, we mitigate bias to improve fairness that we validate with explainability. Um, back to bias, I now want to uh, dive deep into the, um, the, the types of bias. So, so a bi bias can be introduced due to uh, degree, and the degree uh, of, of a given node in a certain graph is the number of edges it is contributing to, like it is connected to other nodes based on some edges. Um, so bias, bias can occur due to uh, having few edges, because if you are an, if, 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 if a given node is having a few num fewer number of edges than another node, then this uh, this edge that has fewer number of nodes um, will have a less informed decision about its label because it, it takes, uh, it, it aggregates less amount of information than this one, for instance. Um, also, um, but, 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 but it's also important to state that high number of edges as well can introduce some problems because um, if there is a node with with some garbage information, with, with some noise or with some outlier. If you, if you are uh, a node that has many edges, you are more likely to have the information propagated from this poisoned node towards your own node. So it's uh, so having many edges is a double-edged weapon. If you have many edges, okay, you have a less uh, a more informed decision, but also the uh, the uh, outlier information might propagate into your um, into your decision. So um, something that I also uh, would like to um, point out is the, the concept of the receptive field. So um, generally, uh, the receptive field is defined in terms of CNNs. For instance, if you, uh, if you want to know the receptive field of uh, a, a given representation for, for, the, for the convolutional neural networks in terms of uh, the earlier layer presentations, then you, you check um, we, what are the pixels in the earlier layer presentations that contribute to this pixel? And in this case, you can see that for this pixel, the nine pixels beforehand contribute to this. And so, and if you get back one further step, you will find out that this five by five grid, each pixel of them contributed to this uh, pixel in the third layer. And, and as you propagate deeper, the, the receptive field is uh, 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 expected to increase. Uh, however, of course, the effect of um, the effect of each pixel is not uh, it's effect of all the pixels is not the same, and 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 this means yeah. For instance, uh, for for a given node uh, in a graph, you can see that it has first degree neighbors and it has second degree neighbors, and of course, the effect of first degree neighbors is not expected to be the same as second degree neighbors, and that's why having um, th having the same sum of neighbors as first degree and second degree does not necessarily mean that you will have the same effect because first degree neighbors are more influential when, uh, in, the, in the platform of message passing. Um, this is an interesting um, this is a, uh, an interesting distribution plotted by uh, the first paper I'm, uh, I'm discussing that shows how um, how degrees are distributed in most of the popular data sets like PubMed, Reddit, um, uh, sites here and Quora, and you can see that they follow a power law where um, low um, low degree nodes are more are generally more than uh, high degree nodes. And uh, it's also important to state that um, the degrees uh, affect the error rate. Uh, you might argue that you cannot capture a pattern that states that. Um, the, the more the degree increases, the error rate decreases. You can you can uh, detect this pattern, but 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 as I said, uh, it's not uh, very uh, clearly correlated or perfectly correlated because having a higher degree might also um, increase the chance of having noise propagated to your prediction. As you can see here, for instance, the, the degree seven has more error rate than degree six in in the case of Quora dataset. Um, okay, the, the second property that I want to discuss before moving to solutions is the distance. And to, um, to understand what's the distance in the, con in the context of GNNs, we have to understand what is the semi-supervised learning setting. So the semi-supervised learning setting is that you have initially graphs that have some labeled nodes and some unlabeled nodes. 
And then with some graph traversal technique, you try to give labels to the unlabeled nodes based on the uh, on the labels of the labeled nodes. And then you end up with a, a fully labeled graph like this. Um, so the distance is defi defined as, there, there are many definitions for distance actually, but um, let's for simplicity state that it's the shortest path between uh, a given unlabeled node and a given labeled node. So for instance, this, uh, this node, I hope you can see my pointer, but this node is close to, or it has a, one, uh, ha has a distance of one from the nearest labeled node here. However, this one is like, you should have to measure the shortest path to be able to know its distance from the nearest uh, uh, labeled node. And um, this, uh, this is reflected on, um, this is reflected on uh, the accuracy and the error rates um, in, in a way that tells that um, the more you have a distance, like you, the more you are far from the labeled node, uh, the, the, the the, uh, the lower accuracy you will get for the prediction of for your node. Uh, and, and this is intuitive because um, the information that is propagated from a labeled node to an, to an unlabeled node is more, is more trustworthy than information uh, that is based on a prediction. So it's, it, it means that you are taking ground truth uh, as, as, as um, a ground truth as a base for your decision. However, in the case of um, being pr uh, information propagated from unlabeled node, you're just taking prediction as a base for your other prediction. So um, that's why uh, the further you are, the further a node is from um, from a labeled node, the, the less accuracy its prediction will have in general. Um, and uh, also the paper discusses uh, an interesting metric called the uh, centrality and centrality has uh, many definitions and uh, has many, um, formulations like mathematical formulations, but um, generally the overall accuracy that's measured on on giving graphs uh, is affected by uh, the, the degree centrality of its labeled nodes, which means that if you place the labeled nodes in more central uh, in more central positions, you are expected to uh, it's it's not also direct correlation. I mean, you are not expected to always increase your accuracy, but there is a, a slightly uh, like growing trend that whenever you place your nodes in, in more central positions, you are expected to improve your accuracy because the average amount of, um, the, the average distances of all other unlabeled nodes is expected to, to degrade or to decrease. Um, the third type of bias that I'm speaking about briefly before introducing solutions is social bias. And this is the general uh, bias problem that all uh, machine learning uh, uh, algorithms uh, encounter, which is the bias based on age, race, or gender. But um, the, the point that I want to, just, to, to add here before moving to solutions is that graph neural networks introduce additional social bias um, due to their uh, graph nature, because the graph structure um, uh, uh, enforces some patterns in the graphs. So for instance, uh, you might argue that uh, people who are German are more likely, oh, oh, that's that's not an argument, that's a very valid assumption, that German people are more likely to be to be connected to, uh, to, to German people uh, more than being connected to uh, other nationalities, let's say French or whatever. So, um, so when you are taking a prediction, uh, the, 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 the nearest neighbor to a given node are are all having the social property of nationality equal to a given nationality, or most of them. So this drives your, your, your prediction. So it's not only about having some bias related to German people in the training data, but also the fact that the node that you are giving a prediction to is surrounded by German people or French people or whatever nationality. And this applies, of course, to other social attributes, not, also, not only uh, nationality. Um, in general, there is a, a very interesting uh, uh, finding that uh, that relates the three problems, which is the fact that the sparsity of some uh, type of nodes versus other type of nodes uh, increases the effect of bias. So, um, in case of degree nodes, so the the, the more 
uh, the, uh, the, the sparsity of high degree nodes versus low degree nodes increases the bias in the network. So if, if, this, if this balance is maintained, you are expected to have less bias. Also for, for the distance-based bias, um, the, the sparsity of labeled nodes versus unlabeled nodes causes the bias. And in case of, uh, of the social bias, uh, the fact that all mitigation techniques um, or most mitigation techniques that try to mitigate social bias are based on predicting the social attribute to be able to counter its effect. Uh, this fact uh, makes the node sharing, uh, uh, node sharing uh, sensitive attribute sparsity versus the nodes hiding sensitive attributes is also a problem. So if you have many people who are sharing some sensitive attributes, let's say the case that they are German, uh, then you are aware of this fact and then you can develop a model that can mitigate this fact. But because many people do not um, uh, do not declare this fact uh, uh, in their public information, um, you, you cannot grasp it and you cannot use it to uh, mitigate the effect. However, the graph structure captures it and it introduces bias using it. Um, okay, so now uh, let's move to our solutions. So for, for the degree-related uh, bias, I'm introducing SLDS GSEN, and I'm, I'm telling in a minute what's this. And for the distance-related bias, I'm, um, I'm uh, uh, introducing the upper bound derivation in the paper because they did not introduce an architecture to mitigate this type of bias. They just introduced um, a, a, a closed form about the, uh, about the, the, the bias, which is a very valuable contribution. And finally, for social bias, I'm introducing FAIR uh, GNN. So uh, first, to understand what SLDS GCN is, it's a long name, um, we, uh, we have to understand that the relations between nodes um, can, can, be, uh, can be classified into three types. If we have a graph and we have some nodes, the, the, the relations between them can be classified into three types. The first type is what, what actually we all know, which is called by the author global shared, shared relations, which is the, 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 the pattern that's captured by the whole graph. So we have a graph uh, of nodes. These nodes exist in the same setting. So let's say if we are speaking about molecules, so these molecules are expected to be in the same body. If we are speaking about a social network, then uh, um, all these accounts should belong to the same social network, let's say Twitter or Facebook or Reddit. And this particular graph has its own um, definition of relations and has its own properties of relations. Um, so this is captured by what's called global shared relations. But the, the author introduces two other definitions of relations. Uh, the first one is called local intra relations. And this is not a very good uh, choice of words because the word local here does not mean spatial does not mean spatial locality i mean this is not does not mean that five and four are local together in, uh, with respect to other uh, nodes of the graph but what the author means by local is that nodes which have some shared features are expected to be um, a, a subgroup of the graph uh, and because we are mitigating degree related bias so this property that we are defining is the degree of the node. So to make this simple, the local intra relations um, uh, in, in our setting are the relations between all the nodes that have degree five, for instance, and all the relations that have uh, degree four and all the relations that have degree three. And this definition makes total sense because uh, if you think of a social network, then people who have certain number of friends let's say a very low number of friends are expected to behave in some manner that's different from people who have a high number of friends. So if you have many, many friends, though, so you are behaving like a celebrity, you don't reply to comments, you don't uh, usually read all comments, but if you are an introvert person, you care about your relationships, for instance, and you care about how you interact with other people. And this should, of course, influence your social behavior. So these are the local intra relations like he uh, the author tries to capture the the fact that nodes having the same degree are behaving in a similar manner the third um, the third relations are local enter relations and and the author states that this is not really very effective but it still exists that um, 
nodes which have the same degree, let's say this 5 and 5 or this 3 and 3, um, would exchange information together. And this exchanged information is attenuated along the way. So if this uh, degree uh, 1 node tries to communicate with this degree 1 node, so the information that's propagated from is propagated through this path, so the, the, the interacted information between these two nodes is almost nothing. But he, he, he is almost not, uh, I mean, not contributing to the, to the label uh, that is um, assigned to these nodes. Uh, so the, the author claims that this amount of information should contribute to the, contribute to the label that's assigned to, a give, to, to the node of the same degree. So this information passed from this one to this one should be amplified a bit so that the, it affects the label, uh, the label that's um, given for, for this node in the end. It's, it's not a very valid assumption. Uh, I mean, the local intra relations seem to be a more valid assumption, but he is, he is also assuming that people who have exactly the same number of friends, for instance, are expected to be friends, which is not really the case in, in this particular application, but might be the case for molecules, for instance. Um, okay, now, Moving to the uh, architecture of SLDGCN. So um, to capture the, this types of relations, local intra relations and local intra relations, the author proposes a recurrent neural network. And why does he uh, propose a recurrent neural network? Because recurrent neural networks have a fixed number of parameters, whatever the, 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 the degree of the nodes would be, the, uh, the, the recurrent neural network would have a fixed number of parameters. And secondly, it can integrate the correlated information among degrees, which means that it integrates the commonalities between, for instance, the, the third degree nodes and the fourth degree nodes and the similarities between these types of nodes. So uh, he, he proposes a recurrent neural network to capture these relations. And then he um, like uh, uh, um, com uh, concatenates here the uh, decisions taken by this GNN with the with these uh, uh, um, features that he captures, so that he takes his final decision um, uh, f for the graph. Um, the training of this uh, graph neural network is done using a, a, a student teacher uh, paradigm and. Uh, uh, the author does this because he, he thinks that um, the, the semi-supervised setting where you assign some labels and then uh, and then you um, and then you have certainty about these labels um, would would help to uh, would help to uh, like improve the um, improve the uh, the network um, accuracy I just don't, I just um, we can ex like we can discuss this in more detail in the questions section I just need to finish my slides in the time because I'm running out of time so um, just in particular um, uh, uh, the, the results of this uh, paradigm the the student teacher uh, like training this uh, training this architecture with the student teacher paradigm results in uh, better results for uh, for, for um, almost all the data sets, yeah, all the data sets that, that were experimented. Um, and we can see here that the, uh, the author performs, um, performs uh, experiments with different percentage of labeled nodes. So only half of the nodes are labeled and you can see how um, the networks um, perform and also tail 4%. Um, okay, so we are moved to distance and back again when we speak about the, the distance generally between an unlabeled node and the labeled node would um, uh, influence the accuracy of the label given to the unlabeled node. And uh, the, the most interesting thing about this paper is the closed form for the error on this unlabeled node. And um, just not to dig into the details of these terms, but uh, it's, it's uh, simply stating that the error on the test data, this unlabeled node, is bounded by the sum of the error on the training data plus a term that is correlated with the distance, which means that um, you have an, a training error and the test error is more than the training error by a term that's correlated with the distance. And this is uh, this means that the distance is uh, like directly proportional with the error and it's a very, very valuable finding. Um, okay, now I move to the social bias, the final model that I'm discussing. FAIR GNN, this is a proposed model to mitigate 
the effect of um, of social bias, which which means the bias based on the, the fact that people are German or are males or females or whatever. So um, the, the author proposes this uh, blue box, GCM-based sensitive attribute estimator. So he 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 proposes that he estimates the attributes for the unlabeled nodes, the sensitive attributes, let's say um, nationality in our example, and then he tries to classify, to do the classification or the prediction task that's done by the original GNN based on the attributes that he estimated. So he estimates that these people are German and then tries to check, um, will, you, will, will I be able to give a prediction about whether this person is a criminal or not, uh, about whether my, my original model will predict that this person is a criminal or not based on his nationality. So if this, if this blue box was able to predict the, the fact, the, the, the output of the GNN classifier, uh, the fact that it will state that this person is a criminal or not based on his nationality, then the GNN classifier is then, um, is then taking the nationality into, his, into his, his, his account. So we are trying to fool this, um, this uh, blue box to not be to not being able to de decide whether the model will predict the uh, the criminal record of a person based on his nationality or not. If this blue box is not able to give it uh, to to predict this decision with a good accuracy, then our GNN classifier in this case is not taking the nationality into account. Uh, and this is uh, I would make this simpler by just in, uh, by just um, uh, showing GANs as an example of min max problem because it's something that many people might know. And for GANs, you add a random noise and you have a generator and a discriminator. And the, GAN, the generator, um, the generator uh, achieves its, uh, its objective when the discriminator cannot decide whether what, uh, what the generator uh, generated is a fake image or uh, an authentic image or a real image. So uh, the generator keeps trying to modify the images that it generates from a random noise until the, the discriminator cannot really decide whether the, 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 the thing that's created by the generator was created by the generator or it's an outside image or the, an image that comes from the outside. So um, the, the final uh, optimization function of the fair GNN has, this, has these terms where you try to make your attribute estimator, um, this loss LA, like have accurate estimations about the attributes like like it's certain that this person is German or French or whatever, and uh, an an error um, uh, le that uh, that that um, that it's it's trying to check the error that it produces uh, versus the prediction of the GNN classifier. So if the GNN classify classified this German as a criminal and the blue box also classified this as a criminal, then the blue box is is performing well. And um, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's not like we are we are not trying to fool the blue box. I, I have mentioned this um, in a wrong way. We are trying to fool the orange box, the adversary. So the, the blue box just gives the attribute the, the attribute estimation for 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 the people. Like it 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 estimates that this person is German or French or whatever. And then the adversary is what tries to compare the the uh, the, the decision of whether a person is a criminal or not that's given based on the blue box or based on our original model. If the adversary is fooled, then our GNN is not uh, basing its decisions on, um, is not basing its decision on sensitive attributes. So for, so the, the LE, it's it's basically the loss of the estimator. So we just have, we it's, it's always good to uh, minimize this, to have a, a, an estimator that estimates the sensitive attribute properly, properly like, um, uh, that this person is German, this person is French, whatever. Uh, LA is something that we are trying to maximize. We are trying to fool the adversary. We are trying to tell it to, uh, we are trying to force it not to be able to distinguish based on the sense of attribute. We have LC, of course, this is the, the original loss of our core model. And we have LR, this is just a constraint that, that is added to, um, to uh, uh, account or to compensate for the instability in the adversarial training. It's a technical thing related to any min-max problem like the GAN. You have instability in the adversarial training, so you add this constraint just to uh, make the training process stable. 
Um, so results, final results for the final model. Um, the this problem is relatively new, so that's why the the author uh, proposes new data sets, POCKEC-C and POCKEC-Z and NBA. So POCKEC is a social network uh, that's used in Slovakia, and he he takes and the user takes um, uh, uh, some accounts that are from a, a given city that starts in C, I don't recall the name of the city, and, and another that starts in Z, and then he, he knows that the private uh, a sensitive attribute of the person is that he belongs to this city, and then he tries to do his classification. Also, this MBA data set um, uh, related to the sensitive information of the nationality of the um, uh, nationality and, and medical records of the players who play for the MBA as sensitive attributes. And um, we have this measure, measuring fairness uh, metrics that are used by the author. Uh, it's, it's important to state that measuring fairness in general, and I think Deborah will introduce this in more detail, uh, are, can be contradicting. So there is not an agreed upon measure for fairness that says that this model is absolutely fair. But what's used by the author is, is statistical parity and equal opportunity. And statistical parity, um, means that uh, the prediction should be um, independent of the sensitive attribute uh, with the probability of Y cap given S equal zero equal the probability of Y cap given S equal one. And the equal opportunity uh, um, is, is, is more um, specific towards the, uh, the positives that are given by our model. So the probability that Y hat equal one, uh, given Y hat equal one and S equal zero should be equal to the probability of Y hat equal one given Y equal one and S equal one. And then we compare models by the delta of SP. So the less, the better. Um, and the comparisons made by FairGNN states that FairGNN performs better than um, all the uh, other um, uh, previous works that are um, oriented towards this problem. Um, and the interesting thing here is that um, fair uh, GAT performs better than fair GCN. Uh, the, good, uh, the good thing about uh, fair GNN is that this GNN classifier can be treated as a black box and you can remove it and put any GNN based architecture and use the, 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 the overall framework with this blue and orange boxes. So uh, the user Im uh, like embeds the GCN into this black box and Im embeds uh, <clears throat> a graph attention um, network and compares the results. And the graph attention network performs better because um, uh, the, the graph attention network gives weights to this interacted information. Uh, but for GCNs, these interacted information are always constants that are fa functions of the number of neighbors of a given node. Um, but these um, alphas um, are related to the uh, internal features of a given node in, in addition to the number of neighbors and features about the neighbors. But uh, having this variability adds a, a, a more degrees of freedom to the, to the network, and that's why GATs perform better than uh, GCNs in, in the setting of um, fair GNN. Uh, however, fair GNNs has some concerns. So um, recall the, the talks that are, uh, were related to privacy yesterday, um, that they are already utilizing the, the embeddings um, that, that are uh, in this GNN classifier. Now you are introducing some embeddings that are actually uh, very well trained to estimate the sensitive attributes that you are trying to uh, not base your decision on. So if you want to uh, violate, so you can use the embeddings of this <clears throat> blue box to directly infer the, uh, the sensitive attribute of a given person. And because they are trained to perform this task already, they are expected to give you a better, uh, uh, a better um, estimate of, the, of this sensitive attribute than the embeddings of the GNN classifier. And then, um, and, and then this can be a, a double-edged weapon. If this is a compensated, then you, uh, you are mitigating bias, but exposing the privacy of people. Also, uh, uh, um, something that the user did not state why he did that is that all of these experiments that uh, are, um, are um, performed to compare models uh, using uh, versus fair GNN and fair uh, GAT uh, use a, a single layer GNN in this black box. 
And this is uh, not typically the case. So normally GNNs have many layers and we would have been interested to know how fair, GNN, uh, fair GCN and fair GAT perform for multi layers. So in conclusion, uh, bias is an important concern and in GNNs and has a special nature due to the graph structures. Uh, local relations uh, among graphs, uh, among graph nodes are valuable to mitigate bias. The test error on a GNN is bounded by the error of the training data and the distance of the node from the nearest label node in a, in a, semi, in a semi supervised setting, of course. And fair GNN mitigates social bias with privacy and validity concerns. And finally, uh, there are many similarities among different types of bias and their proposed solutions, which encourages developing a general architecture for mitigation. Um, you can see this um, two uh, interacting networks, the teacher-student in case of SLDS GCN and, and, um, and, and the, and the um, adversary or the generator discriminator or the min-max problem uh, in the case of uh, fair GNN. Thanks a lot, and I hope this was not more than uh, the time uh, allocated for the session. Thank you for the <clears throat> really nice presentation. Let's everyone give a round of applause. And yeah, we're opening the floor to questions from the audience first. Uh, yeah, we have first question from Nua. Oh, hello. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering where you explained uh, the relation between the accuracy and the distance. Uh, so, uh, what uh, like what kind of distance formulas, uh, distance uh, distances are used, and are these like between node embeddings or attributes, or how basically uh, distances between two are compared? The distance is um, the 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 shortest path between a labeled node and an unlabeled node in a in a semi supervised setting. Oh. So, for for a semi supervised um, setting you have this um, yeah but maybe like in a euclidean space or like images it's uh in a uh, in a grid like structure it's easier to find like euclidean distance or something but for a graph to find the distance between two nodes so i mean oh, no. uh, it's just the number of edges i mean uh, if you have this um um uh, it's like the number of hops like if you have this uh this um, okay so each edge one unit Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, Sade, next question. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Uh, maybe it's not a question, it's just an idea. I was thinking maybe the problem with the node that are not near to the training node is about optimization. You know, for example, we usually have a, a tree layer of the GNN. So the flow of information between training node is uh, in tree hub. So, you know, the node that don't have the labels, they don't contribute as much as the nodes that are in, uh, they have labels. So maybe, you know, the other architecture, for example, like transformer that try to connect all of the nodes and then try to do some, you know, uh, another inductive bias to get the information of the graph, solve the bias problem, you know, I was wondering if you have any idea about it. Um, so, um, so uh, checking the bias in, per in terms of distance um, is relatively uh, a new approach, and uh, the author of this particular paper did not um, did not um, <coughs> uh, introduce a, a, a solution for the problem. But um, given the similarities between the types, the nature of the similarities between these problems. And the the, uh, the solutions between the other um, the, uh, the uh, for the other types of bias, I think this is quite uh, plausible to think about how you can mitigate the distance using something like transformers. Um, I, I think it's doable, but uh, to be honest, I uh, for for my knowledge, I I didn't see something like this being done. But this is very very possible to be done. Yes, maybe to add something uh, to this, Mahmoud already mentioned something like this. I guess there's two problems that are happening here. One is can information travel efficiently from the labeled nodes to the unlabeled nodes? <clears throat> and this is related to um, how many layers we have, the architecture, the classical oversmoothing effect that's happening in GNNs. But the 
other effect that's happening uh, is how much can you trust this information? So if I have uh, ground truth labeled nodes, uh, I should in some sense take their vote in the final uh, prediction for the uh, some unlabeled node more into account than the vote of some un other unlabeled nodes that have been estimated in the message passing um, uh, procedure. So yeah, I, th I think it, it will be actually very interesting to disentangle how much is the effect are we mispredicting this, let's say, nodes in the periphery of the graph because information is not reaching them, or are we mispredicting them because they're just there's not enough labeled nodes around them to get a good estimate? And yeah, I, I think like running um, experiments on the transformer models, as you suggest, would be a very good way to uh, see this effect. Yeah. Um, good. I think Nils was next. Okay, hi. Um, I have a question to the gun style approach. So, what role does the adversary actually play? Like, what does it predict and what does it, so how does it help with the fairness in this case? Okay, so let's uh, recall the criminal problem. You want a GNN that um, predicts if a person is a criminal or not based on his relations. So he might be related to another criminal or something. But in the same time, you, you don't want it to be based on some sensitive attribute of this person. Just because he's a black person or he's a German person, uh, you, you're just stating that he is a, he's a criminal. So uh, what you do is that you, you train this GNN to uh, try to predict whether a person is a criminal or not based on the relations, okay? But then you also uh, use this blue box to uh, to have all your nodes or all your or your nodes labeled with the sensitive attribute. So some people might be known as black or known as Germans, but others are not. Then you will have this this graph using this blue uh, box. You will have a, a copy of this graph that has the sensitive attribute. And um, now this adversary tries to predict. Um, to predict whether a person is a criminal, uh, to, uh, is try, will try to predict whether this network um, will predict uh, that a person is a criminal or not based on his, um, like based on his, on this sensitive attribute or not. So if 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 the adversary was not successful in 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 using the in using this uh, uh, attributes, this sensitive attribute to uh, to predict what the GNN classifier predicted, then this means that the GNN classifier will, did not use the information that the adversary uses. So the adversary uses the sensitive attributes to do its prediction. So um, if it if it could, if it cannot get the if it can, if it get, cannot get the the same prediction as the the GNN classifier then this means that the GNN classifiers does not utilize the same information, which is in case the sensitive attributes, and which is in case our ob final objective. That's okay, and clear. Do, do the adversary, adversary and the GNN classifier share the embedding? So do they use the same embedding to predict like their output or? No, the, ad the adversary uses the uh, sensitive attribute estimator, but the GNN uses the graph structure. The, graphs, the graph structure, can implicitly use the sensitive attribute, but it's it's not like designed to use the. the yeah, sure, but I mean, it's so easy to pick up spurious correlation, especially if you have these interconnections. So, yes, and, I mean, even if you have this, even if you have this adversary, like, how do you guarantee that the actual GNN doesn't implicitly somewhere learn because, spurious because correlations? Because your, your loss function is. Your loss function enforces that um, enforces that these decisions should not with this architecture the, 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 this loss function enforces that this decision should not be based on that because the adversary only uses the sensitive information and the GNN do not the GNN or the GNN does not use it so it so the 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 more there is a discrepancy between their predictions which is actually your optimization problem with this loss function. The, the more discrepancy you have, the more likely the GNN does not capture the or does not utilize the sensitive attribute. It might though use it, but 
the, the, this discrepancy, you are trying to maximize this discrepancy the, the, as much as you can. So the adversary and the GNN prediction should be as dissimilar as possible or? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's that's... exactly the same as um, the generator discriminator problem where the discriminator yeah, but... yeah. is really so similar because Is it yeah. yeah, it's Dr. I mean, because in, relating this to generator discriminator might also yeah, be Yeah, because in GANs, it's actually the case that you just try to generate the data. I mean, it's still this adversary setting, but the it quite often happens that the critique or the discriminator just are very poorly fitted, and then you you have no guarantees whether it really worked. So especially for, for fairness, it seems that this is a rather loose connection for fairness instead of like a proper, like a upper bound or a proof or whatever. Yeah, so, so for many neural uh, approaches, uh, results speak. And, and this actually, the, the reason why there's this concern about uh, using a single layer G, uh, GNNs in your experiments. So this, this particular paper, uses a uh, single layer GNNs in its, uh, in its uh, experiments as this black box and then, um, and then reports the, 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 the improvement in the statistical parity and the equal opportunity uh, given this architecture. But it might be the case that when yeah, you have more layer networks, then this yeah, okay. Um, do they also evaluate other metrics because this architecture seems to be tailored for statistical parity and equal opportunity? They also, of course, report accuracy and AUC. And then, no, I mean other fairness uh, measures, sorry. No, no, they, they don't mention that, but. Only these uh, two, okay. Yeah. Then, okay. This was my question. Thanks. Yeah, I hope I answered it as, as much as I can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to point out I agree with Neil that, um, it's, I mean, there is no guarantee, and um, you can say that if you have like an infinitely powerful adversary or a highly, um, of the adversary has, let's say, many more parameters or something like that than the GNN, you are more confident than there is no information in the embedding uh, about a sensitive attribute. I mean, that, that's really the whole point of what this adversary is doing. It's acting like a discriminator, and it's trying to reconstruct um, or predict the sensitive attribute from the embedding, which then uh, the GNN uses to, to make the predictions. And if you can't do better than chance, you can argue that, um, uh, that there, there is no information contained about the sensitive attribute in this embedding. And I, agree, I guess it's very difficult to get any kind of guarantees. Potentially, you can get some sort of, let's say, generalization guarantees, but uh, about how likely is this adversary to make a mistake, but then you need to make assumptions about the input distribution, test distribution, and so on. And th those are not going to be useful in practice. And, and I completely agree that this is very tailored to uh, this particular fairness metrics, which are far from the only ones or the most important ones. Uh, so yeah, those are, those are very good critiques. Um, all right, next I think was Deborah. Okay, yeah, I think uh, my question is, um partly in line with uh, um, Nils's question with regards to the metrics. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, so I just wanted to know, um, did, in the paper, did they make um, some analysis of um, probably if they don't include um, the, 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 like they don't impose like the fairness or the strategy they used here, how is the performance? Do their methods still um, relatively have a good performance though they are um, getting um, Fair. I don't, I don't know if you mentioned any. I didn't see anything of that sort. Um, I'm not sure you mean. Um, you mean if they are using other fairness metrics or no, not I... other fairness metrics? So generally, we understand that um, once you are um, ensuring fairness, it's more like a trade-off with your yes. uh, accuracy. Yes. Well. Yeah. So did they do any analysis to indicate um, how much accuracy they? Tend to lose yeah. wealth in pollution. They are they are already reporting accuracies um, and AOC scores here. So right. uh, for for um, so th they argue that uh, for this particular experiment that they performed having a single layer GNN, 
the the accuracy did not degrade drastically. So if the the, the best performing models, as you can see on the uh, left, are GCN and, and GAT. Uh, so when you uh, when you introduce uh, fair GNN and fair GAT, you can see that the degradation is like from 70.2 to 70, and from 70.4 to 70.1. So uh, there is a degradation indeed, um, also for the AUCP scores, but uh, but uh, they, they argue that this is not really the, like it's not um, it's not uh, like it, it can be uh, accepted in the context that you are improving uh, uh, the like you are reducing the the statistical parity by nine percent and in, uh, and re sorry and reducing the uh, equal opportunity to one point seven which yeah to to recall the less the better for for these particular matrix okay all right thanks. Yeah, one caveat to add to that is that these data sets are really very toy. So you can think of them as the amnest of this problem. Uh, I mean, this, this whole area of algorithmic fairness and graphing networks is rather new. Uh, and we really need more complex, more realistic data sets to evaluate what's going on. And I agree with you that very likely we'll see trade-offs between accuracy and fairness, especially if we use a more comprehensive definition of fairness. Um, but yeah, on this toy data sets, apparently it works. Yeah, uh, I think Pablo is next. Hi everyone, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just have like a, a follow up comment on the on the question of of the of, of the distance, because it it happened that I was reading about this point of of smoothing the last week, and I I found about this other problem that DNN has that is called over spacing. It basically means that when you have when you when you need information from a lot of hops ago, then you just need to condense all these messages that in the message passing happens into a single vector. And then what is happening here is that you're just losing all the information. So I, I think that that's that's probably also related to that. And also I read like exactly what I think it was Sajet said that one of the solutions they propose is in the last layer, just connect everything with everything, and it looked like it was working better. Which for me is a bit weird because you are losing all the structure of the graph. But yeah, it's like a simple solution. Yeah, people have been looking a lot more into this over squashing phenomena, where, as you said, yeah, the information is condensed into single vector. And yeah, there's some solutions out there, but I guess we haven't set out on what is the correct solution there. Yeah. And people first try out hacks and then see if it works. And it works. Yeah, I don't think to be that, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we have another question from Adash. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. So I think uh, I had a question about the RNN part of the uh, slides. I'm, I'm, I couldn't like understand what exactly is the input for the RNN here in a sense. Is it just generating uh, weights uh, according to the degree of the node so that those weights get multiplied it like kind of like a normalization scheme that is happening here or i'm not entirely sure i understand yes, yes. there are parameters that take into account uh, the the degree of the node so for each uh, particular degree there will be a different set of weights um and um it's it's no it's 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 an r and n so they, they are not it's a different set but it's also an, like they are overlapping sets. They are not exclusive sets. So, um, uh, yeah, so th this is what happens. You, you just try to um, engage the, the, the fact of the degree information between the nodes into, into, into your prediction. Um, actually, um, the, the author did not dig so deep into the mathematics of doing this, uh, but this is roughly the idea. Like you have parameters that are tuned to consider the uh, the degree into 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 the uh, into the output, and then the the their their contribution is um, is um, in like contributed to the the output of the normal GNN. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, to phrase it differently, how I understood it, you you have some trainable parameters that are the input of the RNN and the RNN outputs the set of weights for each degree. So the first output is to, for the first degree, the second state is to, for the second nodes with degree two, third state for nodes with degree three and so on. So the 
are then outputs the weights which you then use in a GNN. Yeah, but and this means that actually the weights for degree one also contribute to the output of degree two, but not in not directly, and that's why they are not exclusive set. Oh. All right. Do we have any other questions? I have one question about, uh, can you expand on this student-teacher training uh, that you jumped over in your presentation? It was, I just, uh, it's not giving me time. Um, so um, the idea here we have uh, for, for, for SL, uh, so we have this degree specific, a specific uh, uh, GCN, but um, the, the idea here is that um, when you have um, an, a, a prior idea about the labels for the unlabeled nodes, uh, uh, your accuracy is going to be better. So it's just that uh, we, we create a Bayesian neural network uh, that takes the graph and, and, and uses the Bayes rule just to have pre-labels. And then these three labels are fed to the to the to the degree specific GCN that we introduced earlier here. This this degree specific GCN. So these labels are fed to 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 the degree specific GCN just to improve its uh, its accuracy. Of course, there the 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 certainty of this um, of this uh, pseudo labels are is put into consideration uh, uh, with, with like it's it's. It's it's mathematically represented. Uh, just just that the the student um, the student which is this architecture is not fully uh, basing its uh, its decision based on this uh, pseudo labels that are introduced by the BNN. So the BNN introduces pseudo labels with some certainty, and the student has the the choice to take them into consideration with the with like based on the certainty of the BNN. And the BNN bases its certainty on probability, of course. And is the BNN another Bayesian graph neural network, or is it some different kind of model? It's not, it's not mentioned as a graph neural network. It's just a Bayesian network. Like I, I think you can uh, apply Bayesian uh, traversal for for a graph, like for instance loopy belief propagation or any other propagation for for using the Bayesian uh, theory. So it's not a graph neural network. At least this this was not mentioned. It's not a graph neural. It's just a Bayesian neural network. Uh, just um, just based on ba like, like based on exchanging information using Bayes rule. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uses only the graph structure, but not node features. Or yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, I just had a small question in the, on this slide. Like, what is the annotator here? Like, is it the same as the BNN, or is it a different one? Uh, uh, the, uh, this looks like, um, I, I, I cannot recall, to be honest, um, the, the separation between them. Um, but from what I see here is that we have some initial pseudo labels um, from, the, from the graph that has labeled and unlabeled nodes. And the BNN shall then tune this pseudo labels based on the probability theory or based on the Bayesian theory to be to be accurate. So this annotator is just uh, doing some random labels. It's not really something, it's not really an architecture or some. Um, okay. Uh, but but I, I have to, I have to say that I'm not sure about this answer because um, I cannot recall now how it was, but what I recall is that the, the, the computed, the computational part of this a student teacher uh, architecture is based on the BNN. So the BNN is what uh, traverses the graph and and gives some pseudo labels and gives some certainty for these pseudo labels um, based on the Bayesian formula. But the the annotator, I cannot recall there was something some co uh, computations. I think it's just an initializer. Okay. So like you have some initial noisy labels and then the BNN tries to fine tune it for the to get the pseudo labels or the probabilities. Okay. Okay. Any further questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again and uh, move to the next talk.